four, five. Good evening and welcome to the show, Brookfield Public Advocate. I'm your host, Bruce Senek. Tonight, we'll have a second chance to educate ourselves about ethics and conflicts of interest. For those of you who may have missed the first show or would like to view it again, you may do so and on YouTube at www.youtube.com slash Brookfield Public Advo. We're fortunate to have Mark Davies with us again, the, who's the Executive Director of New York City's Conflict of Interest Board. Tonight's show will deal with hypothetical situations that might occur and how the appropriate regulations are applied. For Mr. Davies' background, I would again ask viewers to access the clips on YouTube. Suffice it, suffice it to say, it's quite impressive. And again, I want to point out that our discussion with Mr. Davies does not necessarily represent the view of the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board or the City of New York. Mark, we have a lot to cover, <laughs> so let's get right to it. First, I'd just like to ask uh, if you could give us a, a few definitions um, and comments on uh, some of the terms that uh, I think would be helpful to the audience. First of all, misuse of office. Well, misuse of office is uh, one of the, perhaps the single most critical provision in a code of ethics. Uh, and basically what it says is that a public official, a public servant, may not use or misuse uh, his or her position to benefit, really to financially benefit uh, himself or herself, a family member, or anyone with whom that official has a private business or financial relationship, like his employer or his uh, outside business or something like that. Okay. Well, following up on that, uh, if you talk to uh, misuse of city resources. That's another critical provision. Uh, and basically, a, an ethics code will often prohibit uh, public officials from using um, of, uh, the resources of that municipality, for example, of the town, for a non-municipal, a non-town purpose. So, for example, uh, I cannot uh, ask the, if I'm the, uh, say, on the uh, city council, I could not ask uh, the um, transportation department to pave the parking lot for my church, because that's not, that's, not that's not a government function. Uh, and uh, that would be a misuse of resources, misuse of time, misuse of, uh, of personnel, uses of, misuse of equipment supplies, that's all misuse of resources. Yeah, I think that's how a, a former governor of, of this state uh, found himself uh, behind bars uh, uh, several years back. Yeah, I think I heard about that. <laughs> uh, talk, to, talk to gifts. Uh, probably one of the most uh, significant issues that arises uh, in conflicts of interest and ethics codes in, in, involves gifts. Uh, and most ethics codes will have some prohibition on accepting gifts. Uh, certainly from anyone that does business with that, with that government. So, for example, if I'm uh, on a city council, uh, I could not accept a, a gift uh, of, of, of more than just a very nominal value uh, from um, anyone that does business with, with the city. That would, uh, and sometimes there's also provision that would prohibit me from accepting a gift uh, if I'm receiving it just because of my official position, even if the giver is not doing business with the, uh, with the municipality. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, something uh, I think uh, that may occur, certainly in the, in the area here, uh, moonlighting. Yeah, moonlighting. I mean, uh, our, our, our training director at the, at the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board uh, will note that uh, uh, you know that many officials, you know, have to moonlight because they're not paid enough for their you know, for their municipal job. Uh, although certainly in this economy, <laughs> it's a good job to have. Uh, and the, the restriction there has to be that you you cannot mix your private business or your private employment and your government job. So, for example, there may be a prohibition uh, on having a uh, a job with any company that d does business with your particular agency, even if you're not involved as a government official with that agency. 
and a little bit uh, in the same area, owning businesses. Yeah, owning businesses, uh, mo what we've so far been talking about are really uh, prohibited conduct provisions. They address your conduct. Uh, when you're talking about owning business, now you're talking about a prohibited interest, which, which raises you know, other, other issues. Uh, on the other hand, there is a question as to should you, be, should you own a business that is doing business with your own municipality and therefore getting money from your own municipality, from the town or whatever. Uh, and ethics codes will often have some kind of restrictions on ownership of businesses where the business is, has business with uh, your own government or your government agency. Mm -hmm. Uh, just just a few more here, and then I'd like to get to some hypothetical situations. Uh, Post-employment one-year ban. Yeah, the, the post-employment restrictions are, uh, again, among the very most important in, in an ethics code. And the idea is that you shouldn't be able to leave your government position today and tomorrow trade on that position. Uh, in particular, the one you just mentioned, a post-employment ban, when, and, there, and there are various links. Uh, in New York City, it's one year. At the state of New York, it's two years. The federal government is five years. But the idea is that for some cooling off period, for example, one year, after I lo leave government service, I cannot appear on behalf of a new employer before my old agency because the idea is I know who to go to, I have all these contacts, I, I know the ins and the outs and confidential information and so forth, and I, I shouldn't be trading on that because that's going to be detrimental to the public if I do. What, what about some appointed um, positions that are, are you know, not people that are not compensated but yet work for a firm that may have, have dealings that go before? Um, yeah, uh, it, it, particularly at the municipal level, much of municipal government is staffed by volunteers at the highest levels. Uh, it's, it's very often uh, true that your legislative body uh, gets a very, almost only a stipend. Uh, in New York State, some places they get nothing. Uh, it's also true that some of your most important uh, appointed bodies, uh, zoning boards, planning boards, uh, architectural review boards, and so forth, are staffed by pure volunteers. And when you're dealing with volunteers, you have to be a little bit careful, or who's going to volunteer for these positions. Right. So typically, the restrictions may be um, a little less onerous. The restrictions will still apply, but instead of having a, a municipal-wide prohibition, you'd only have a prohibition for your own agency. So for example, if I'm on a zoning board, uh, the law, may, the ethics code may prohibit me from um, uh, from dealing with the ethics board in my zoning board capacity, but it would not prohibit my private business from appearing before the zoning board. So uh, just a recusal would, a recusal would be only, sufficient. That's right. So it would not be a prohibited interest. It would just be a it would just be a recusal requirement. Okay. Um, and then post-employment, uh, particular matter bar. Talk to that again. A little that's bit. another very important restriction on. Uh, what you do after you leave government service or leave uh, municipal service. Uh, and the idea is that if you work on a particular matter, you yourself personally and substantially work on a particular matter while you're in government service, you should never, ever work on that matter in the private sector. Because you know you have inside information, even if you don't uh, disclose any of that confidential inside information, you worked on that. And you also do not want to put of officials in the position of kind of like setting themselves up to go into the private sector and make a killing because right. they they've been working they've they, they've been working on this particular matter and uh, they've constructed the uh, they've written the uh, the request for proposals in such a way that only this company they're going to go to can possibly bid on that on that uh, on that contract. So that's the idea behind a particular matter bar. Again, yeah. a very important provision. Um, we talked in, in the first show a little bit about you know disclosure and re recusal. Could could you talk to that again, and, and particularly some of the things that uh, with with the recusal, what what a person has to do? Yeah, the um, it's critical 
that government officials not use their office for, for, for non-government, for private purposes. As I mentioned before, misuse of office is probably the single most important ethics code provision. Uh, well, how do you prevent that? I mean, what happens if a situation is, prevented, is presented to an official where they would have to use their office for, uh, for uh, to benefit, say, their private outside employer? And the answer is they have to disclose that conflict of interest, and then they have to recuse, that is, disqualify themselves from being involved in that manner. And uh, contrary to what I think a lot of people, including a lot of officials, seem to think, when you recuse yourself, recusal means you are out of it 100%. You don't go and sit in the audience and say, oh, I'd like to speak as a private citizen. No. When you recuse yourself, you can't get any emails, any correspondence. You can't sit in meetings to discuss it. You can't be in the room when that matter is discussed. You were out of the picture 100%. That's what recusal requires. And being in the room in the audience, even if you keep your mouth shut, you, you cannot you be there. You know what? If you're in the room and keep your mouth shut, the problem is it, has, it can have a chilling effect on other people saying something okay. from the public. And, it, and your mere presence, say you're, if you're, say, the chair of the zoning board, and they, have to, and they, are, uh, they are determining whether or not this controversial uh, but critical to your business zoning uh, uh, matter is going to be determined in your favor or against you, and there you are sitting in the audience just as a <laughs> member of the public, right? Yeah. So it's uh, you should get out of the room. Yeah, uh, chilling I think is the, is the right word. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, quick uh, qu uh, uh, reference to our, our first program again as, as well. Um, I'm I'm in in conversation with the uh, chair of Brookfield's um, uh, chairman, uh, uh, chair of the Board of uh, uh, Ethics, and trying to, to get the, the individual to come on the show. And um, the, the board doesn't have regular meetings. Uh, in my trying in to, to have her appear, she had uh, sent a letter to me about um, what the board does. We investigate matters, assemble facts, and make recommendations to the board of selectmen, and they are free to accept or reject our recommendations. I think in the, in the first show, um, you, you talked to the, how the, the board has to be completely independent. Could, could you address that again? Yeah, there are, there are a lot of indicia of, of independence that we really can't go into tonight, but uh, certainly one of them is that the board, the ethics board, should have the power uh, to investigate a potential violation, including subpoena power, uh, and then, to, if it, and then it, to find the violation occurred and then to impose a penalty, a monetary penalty, a civil fine. It's not criminal penalties, there's civil fine. Right. Uh, the amount of the fine is probably, the maximum amount of the fine is probably not that relevant because what is really relevant is that a fine has been imposed by an independent body. That's what's really critical. And what's critical to the public is that an independent body has looked at this matter and made a determination. Um, and so it's, it's clearly vastly preferable if the ethics board itself has the power to impose fines. The problem with ethics laws is that they have to be passed by the legislative body. <laughs> this is the only instance in when these legislators are passing laws to regulate themselves. And it's, it's, it's tough. It's hard. I mean, it, it, and if I were on the, on the legislative body, it wouldn't be easy for me either. Right. I, don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like it's easy. It's not easy. It's very hard. You're passing laws to regulate yourself. Uh, it's got its own conflict. It's, yeah, it, it does, <laughs> and, and it's hard. Uh, 